pass from Havili was magic. The shift on for Crotty. Boom, far down you go, Quaggett Smith. Me, oh my, I haven't enjoyed that. Yes, boy. Sit back, relax, put your belt on. Enjoy the Draft Rugby, the game they play online in heaven. Welcome to episode 23 of the Draft Rugby Show. I'm joined by my brosif and fellow semi-final competitor, Nelson. How are you going? Yeah, not going too bad. It's good to be one week into the semis and, and it's good that we still have an Aussie team alive. Yes, and I'd like to air my grievances because we're not doing a dessert at the start of the show and we are recording extra late tonight because you wanted to watch Rugby League. What do you have to say for yourself? Guilty and also disappointed in the quality of the game. It's Rugby League. What did you expect? So there <laughs> you go. I think... Uh, that okay. says all about uh, yourself, but uh, I, I guess people are stuck listening to you since they've tuned into the podcast, so we'll push on. Now, it's only you and I tonight. We'll do a very quick recap of the, the quarters, and then let's spend a little bit of time on the semis. So game one for our entree was the Crusaders versus the Reds. The Crusaders up 37 to 15. We talked about the Reds coming out and saying it was going to be the Queensland, you know, origin style defense. And I thought they did pretty well. 56 minutes. They were uh, really close. 16, 15, two fantastic tries from the Reds. And then the elastic kind of broke when Richie Moe, was sliding across field, stepped inside and scored his try. And then from there, it was kind of one-way traffic. What do you think of this one? Oh, look, it was, it was good to see a few things from the Reds, you know, getting the ball to their wings, a few good set-piece plays. Um, and, it, and they really did show that there is some defensive errors there in the Crusaders' side, despite going down. And, and for me, one of those was positionally and choice-making from playing Anuku and, and pace from Goodhue. So definitely some weak spots there that teams can try to capitalise on. Yeah, absolutely. The, the good Hugh Pace coming back from his ACL, that's a real worry. I, I hope he gets some back because he's such a class player. But, you know, he was obviously made to work extra hard because of Lester Fanger and Nuku's defence, but he just looked like he was on a treadmill. He wasn't moving. Yeah, no, look, I think playing Nuku made it hard on him, but, yeah, he did, definitely didn't look quick. Yeah. The second game was the Chiefs beating the Waratahs 39 to 15. Not exactly the result that we were hoping for, predicting, betting on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Actually pretty one-sided when you have a look at the actual score in the end. For me, the highlight was actually the Chiefs' first try off the line-out where they did the sneaky little play with Brad Weber eventually sneaking around the back of the line-out and going through pretty much untouched and scored from and scoring from memory. He scored a double, but, man, that was a cool little trick play, and I, I do love a, uh, a classy line-out move, and I know you do too. Oh, I'm a big fan. It's one of my favourite parts of footy, that's for sure. But look, the, the Tars seemed to stay in it for the first half, maybe to 50 minutes, even with the score line not necessarily reflecting that. But they really just had to, you know, got, got made to pay for their, their mistakes. That Tainted mid throw uh, or way, wayward pass that hit the ground. Uh, Nankervell capitalised on. Also, they, they kicked 40% of their kicks off the tee and had 11 to 6 penalty count. So... Yeah, just made to pay, really, for, for not being on the best. It, it did feel like they cut out that mistake. They kicked their goals, and maybe while they're kind of hanging in there, the score line's a lot tighter, and then, you know, the pressure starts to build, whereas I think those those errors just cost them any kind of pressure in the game. And that yeah. that try off the Tainted Med missed pass in his own 22, that's Fiji and Endure stuff, right? Like, that's what they were doing at the start of the season, just craziness to be trying to attack from there. When you have a set defensive line as well, I just don't understand that. Yeah, you're supposed to simplify in the finals, and and that wasn't it. <laughs> no. But uh, Luke Japes, Jacobson, I thought special mention to him. I thought he had an absolute blinder, easily his best game of the year for mine. Um, I, I just hadn't really seen the form that we that we know that he's capable of. I thought he was just absolutely dominant in this one, obviously scoring a try. But outside of that, I thought he was great around the park. And then the Will Harris 60-metre oh. run to the line after a Michael Hooper break. I was hoping that uh, Kagi mm. was on tonight because that was Isaiah walker leah Ware esque I know he's a brilliant. back row and not, not a lock, but mate, he's surely Kagi's going to be talking about for that for the, for years to come. Oh, it was it was so good to see. Awesome. The, that third matchup of of the weekend was the Blues 
uh, walloping the Highlanders. I'll say that because it was slightly more than some of the Aussie losses. Um, 35 to 6. Really, the the Blues were just dominant ball in hand. Really, the, the Highlanders stayed in it early, but the Blues doubled the tackle bus 36 to 18 uh, and 8 to 2 line breaks. They were just way too physical despite the loss of Dalton Papali'i and the, the back row that Kagi wanted to see of Akira Papali'i in Satutu. We just still didn't get to see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I don't think it's going to happen, sadly, this year. But look, I think there was a lot of adversity for the Highlanders to overcome in this one. Aaron Smith pulled on, I think it was Thursday night when he did his groin in training. Then you had Th- Thomas Amunga Jensen injuring his shoulder very early on, trying to tripping on for 20 minutes, trying to make, make his D tackles in with one arm. Then you had 32 minutes, Scott Ger- Gregory tears his hammy, trying to kick a ball away after the whistle. I like, didn't even have to kick it. <laughs> Yeah. And then on, on top of that, 54 minutes, you got Billy, sorry, Billy Harmon after 65 minutes as well. And the McAleo red card at 18 minutes, not to mention that one. So, man, just some serious adversity for them to overcome. And it was all just a bit too much. The Blues kind of put them away. Yeah, the Blues just, you know, too good to, to let those opportunities slip. Uh, we also had the Ethan DeGroot, you know, showing up uh, off to Uma Farsi at scrum time, which is surprising. There's Yes, Ethan DeGroot's been talked up a fair bit, but really interesting to see him, you know, take that, that step forward, um, even when they had a forward down. Yeah, that was very surprising, to be honest, but he was definitely the dominant man. And the word is that uh, Ofatunga Fasi is going to be dropped to the bench for the semi final based off of that, I think. So uh, he's made his mark, and I think that might actually solidify a spot for him in the uh, All Black squad later this year. So good yeah. on him. Uh, I think he's definitely developing as a player. He is definitely. Let's let's jump into that final matchup. The the Brumbies getting the win against the Canes, thirty five to twenty five. The interesting thing out of this for me is the Canes had a little bit more possession, but the the Brumbies they they managed to really dominate the territory. Um, they made twenty one to six tackle busts. Sorry, yeah, the Canes had twenty one to six tackle busts, three to one line break, but they just couldn't really make the Brumbies pay. Um, and I think some of the big issues for them were they turned over double or the ball, which eight to four. They also, their set piece really struggled. They lost three of their own line outs, three of their scrums where the Brumbies were hundred percent in the set piece. So although they, you know, were, were dominant on occasion, ball in hand could break the line, could, you know, get past the gain line. They couldn't really put it all together because they'd, they'd end up losing the ball. Or it would go to set piece and they'd lose it. And the Brumbies really could manage the territory a whole lot better in this one, even though, you know, there was a few few hiccups early. Yeah, and the uh, the big talking points are obviously the Lenny Katow red, followed by the Owen Franks yellow. I'm very much in this side of, of the camp saying so, you know, Owen Franks was as bad, if not worse, than Lenny Katow's and just don't understand how Katow now has a three-match ban, won't play again in the finals where Owen Franks gets a 10-minute binning and that's all. But on that time when the uh they were you know two minutes apart so with the extra time a man down the brumbies ended that period 15 to 25 down and then as soon as they were back to a full complement they finished the game 20 points to nil to finish at 35 to 25 yeah. so you know they obviously went into the half regathered themselves made a plan and they were just absolutely dominant to end that game. And it showed the gap between the two teams. And I think we got to see why the Brumbies really are title contenders. Yeah, and somehow they managed to keep Artie Sevilla quiet. The talk about Tom Hooper, you know, really just sticking to him as a man-on-man defence. Um, I'm not sure if you saw that um, throughout the game. But, yeah, it's it, if you can keep Artie Sevilla quiet when he normally carries the team on his back, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, an amazing effort from the Brumbies and in particular Hooper. Fantasy Man of the Week. Now, I'm going to refer to this one. It's obviously in your background right now. I was just looking at your uh, your image there for the final series. Surely we've got to give them a different background now. So we can't have the, uh, the same card for the uh, final series fantasy players of the week as well as the fantasy team of the year. Come on, you've got to get that FIFA style, like different, different backgrounds for each one. Sorry, mate. I've got, I've got enough on my hands. <laughs> anyway, look, anyway, I thought they looked quite different, but that's fair. They, they, they do look awesome. So Bodie Barrett, <laughs> 78 points for the Fantasy Man of the Week. He played for 80 me- minutes, made 80 metres. Obviously, he's two tries, 
six tackle busts, two offloads, a line break, and three of his five mm-hmm. tackles. So very, very solid from him. You also had an honourable mention to his Blues counterparts, Roger Duavasa Sheck and Stephen Perra franchise, both on 62 points. And I thought Duavasa Sheck, this was probably the coming of him. This was the best game I've seen him play. He was dominant. And all of a sudden, that All Blacks jersey is looking very, very close. He's definitely building towards it. Some good line running and just some good, you know, footy all around the paddock. We didn't have any super sub this week. We had to manually do our scores. So we only did the players that played um, in, in the starting sides. Um, but there was a Captain Mud award and that was Andrew Macaleo, the bowling ball with his 13 minus 13 points with his red card after 22 minutes. Stitch me up big time, mate. I had Parecki Love. starting for me who got pulled pre-game. Macaleo subs in and gets a red. Not happy about that see one. It. You love to see it. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> let's move on. All right, the main course, let's talk about the thing that we're here for. So semifinals yes. on Friday, you have the Crusaders playing the Chefs. New injuries, the Crusaders. Ethan Blackadder has dislocated his left shoulder. He's going to go have an MRI scan to see how bad the damage is. I think he's highly likely to have a uh, an operation. Young man in his 20s playing professional sport. The chance of him re-dislocating mm. is so, so high. There's a World Cup next year. I reckon they're going to err on the side of caution. You won't see him until Super Rugby next year so that he's 100% fit for the World Cup. He's not yeah. exactly a position that you avoid making shoulder contact. As well. Yeah, and if they roll the dice and he does it next mm. year, his, his World Cup's done. Like, I, I just don't see why they take that risk. But anyway, Agreed. we're not going to see him in finals regardless. Finlay Brewis was pulled pre-game. We hear he's available but not named in the 23 anyway for this year. And then returning fit again is Quinton Strange with his calf injury, but he hasn't made the 23. So I think the Crusaders really trying to minimise their changes now and get as much continuity as they can. Obviously happy with... Zach Gallagher on the bench um, and nothing from the chefs. I don't think in returning just uh, chase tear tear back at the, on the bench at fullback and, Oh, sorry. We say hey, that. Sammy, Sammy Kane on the bench. He's, say, a, yeah, there he's is a pretty more. big name player. <laughs> yeah. Should mention him. <laughs> yeah. No, he's pretty good. I think we should give him a shout out. Yeah. hundred percent. So he, uh, they said apparently the reason that he is not starting is uh, Clayton McMillan said because they want to reward the form of the loose forwards that's actually starting in the side and they've just been so good and he wants to see them get some <clears> continuity. <throat> now, this is crazy to me. We rag on Sam Cannon oh, a yeah. bit here, but mate, Sam Penny Finau is starting for them and I like Finau, but Sam Kane has to be picked above Sam Penny Finau. And that oh, is that's... crazy. That's absurd. absurd. Let's just look at Sammy Penny for now last week to see if he can change our mind. So last week in an 80 minute showing, he made five carries for 20 meters, nothing else. So no tackle bars, nothing like that. And he made six tackles, but missed one. That's his entire game. So that would be in Sam Kane would be, you know, 15 plus tackles. His runs, you know, would have been at least a little bit more destructive, even though he's not that destructive of a ball runner. That seems crazy to me. Not to mention the leadership. Yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't yeah. understand that at all. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll press on. Look, the last time these two played each other, the Crusaders got up uh, away from home, 19 to 34. They scored three tries to nil in the second half to kind of run away with that one when it was very tight. I think they were slightly down at half time. The Chiefs had a full strength side out there, or more or less a full strength side, very similar to this week. The Crusaders had a bit of an experiment. They had Finger, Finger Anuku, at 13, Chafiaki on a wing, Bridge on the other, and then no Matera, no White Lock, and they also had Finlay Brewer starting at loose head. But uh, I guess let's not forget the result before that, Nels. Yeah, so the result before that also in uh, in, in the Crusaders' hometown, and, and they went down 21-24. The Chiefs managed to get the win there. So and I I think they've, they've had a couple wins in recent years. They, they got a win back in 2021 as well. You know, the last four matches, they're, they're 50-50. So, I mean, the, the Chiefs are going to enter this with a sniff. Don't count them out as big underdogs here. I, I think they're, they're really going to be coming into this match, you know, trying to push their, their state for a finals playoff. Yeah, and no, if I remember correctly, I think they played each other two weeks in a row and it was kind of the back-to-back yeah. back, and all the talk was, oh, the Crusaders haven't lost two games in a row for <laughs> 185 <laughs> years or whatever it was and Chiefs <laughs> could do it to them twice in a row. And, of yeah. course, it didn't happen. I think we kind of saw Crusaders, even though they rotated their team, yeah. come out and play with 
a real purpose. And I think we're going to see this week as well. So, you know, motivation's very high. I think the Chiefs will be better than they were in that second game. But, um, geez, that's they're, they're an angry beast when you've got one over the Crusaders and they want to get one back over you. Yeah, look, I, I think the Crusaders really have built into the back end of this season really, really well. They've had a few slip-ups. Um, obviously, against the Waratahs was was another one that, you know, happened towards the back end of the year. But they really have, you know, started to build some more momentum, get their best side on the paddock in, in recent weeks, um, and, and they're building nicely. Interestingly, the Crusaders' home record this year is only five wins and two losses. Both Crazy. the Chiefs and Blues mm. beat them at home. So maybe not the fortress it once was, but of course, they've still never, ever lost a Super Rugby Finals fixture. So that's a reasonable record to try and hold on to. It's changes, changes in the Crusaders side. You've got Tom Christie coming in, the specialist open side to cover Blackadder. We know how good he is. So, yes, they miss some size there and maybe even a bit of uh, work rate fitness considering that Blackadder, I believe, is the fittest in the side. Um, and then out, got- he, he's apparently on our system here. He's got the most tackles throughout the entire season and he's been rotated in and out of that side. So Christy. he must be making, yeah. He's making he played, some, I, some I looked at his tackles. stats earlier today when I was prepping myself for fantasy draft semi-final round two tomorrow. Um, he played most of his minutes were 80 minutes. So I think he's actually had a fair bit yeah. more minutes than, uh, <clears throat> than it might seem when you just have a look at the, uh, the depth of outside back of uh, outside, sorry, loose forwards that they have there. Yep. Obviously also with that, if Chrissy's in to start, you get, Corey Kello, Kellow um, from Canterbury onto the bench, a 21-year-old open side flanker, which... Blind uh, side, blind side flanker, I'm pretty sure. Big, relatively I think, big boy. I think, I think they named him as a, as a specialist open side uh, when they? they interviewed the coaching staff. Okay. But maybe, maybe you can play both, maybe. Um, other changes, Tamatai Williams, Tamati Williams, um, sorry, excuse me, is uh, he came into the side on the bench last week with uh, the late change and he's getting another run this week as particularly, I guess, after scoring a try, you got to reward him for that as well. Um, and I think that's all the changes for them. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's, there's just too much class in that back line to change it up. You know, we, we talked about bridge on the bench and all on the bench and, and right now it, I mean, we believe they're the two guys that should be on the bench for them in those positions. So um, despite good Hughes slowness, as we were touching on, and playing in Nuku's poor defensive reads a couple of times last week, they're, they're still clearly, you know, the, the better two men for the job for mine. If we go across into the Chiefs, the 1-14 to 14 is unaffected, unchanged from last week. And we have Josh Uwani slotting into that 15 jersey with Chase Tia Tia coming onto the bench and, and Narawa moving out of the match day 23. And for me, it's an, it's an interesting one. I mean, Narawa's balls to the wall. You know, you're going to try to be a dynamic running team. And yes, you've got that in Josh Uwani, but he also adds more of a tactical kicking game and a smarter game at that 15 jersey for them. I think the other thing is I, I just feel yeah. like the Chiefs know that they're going to have to score 30-odd points to win this game. And Josh Uwani is the guy that can do that. I think he's probably going to leak you a few points as well, to be honest with you. There might be an intercept try or two for the likes of uh, Sevu Reese but, or Will Jordan or something like that. But, man, he's just such an X-factor player. I think that he probably poses the most threat and he's probably the guy that the Crusaders are going to be most worried about facing. Um a couple more Chiefs, changes on there as well. You mentioned the outside backs. We said Sam Kane on the bench coming back from his MCL. And you got George Dyer as well gets a run off the bench for Artu Molly, which I thought was pretty big. Like Molly's obviously a pretty experienced player in these big games. So they've obviously seen something out of Dyer or there's been an injury there, something that hasn't really been announced to the public. Yeah, I mean, if you're bringing Dyer on for Molly, for me, it, it really makes sense that there's something else that we don't know about there. That's that's the only real explanation for mine. Um, the the interesting thing in this matchup is there's going to be a real battle in the forwards, um, the, the set-piece play, especially with, I think, everyone's eyes on the, the lock pairing between these two sides. You've got Retallick and Vai on one side, and you've got White Lock and Barrett on the other um, the last time these two guys met, you, you only had Retallick and you only had Barrett on uh, in the locks, but you had Vai in the number six jersey for the Chiefs, and, and it really bore fruit for them having that extra lock 
in, in that lineup with uh, Lord as the other second rower. They only lost one of their own lineouts, but they stole three against the Crusaders. So, look, it, it's been interesting. I mean, Lord, is he still injured, Harry? Yeah, well, he, he was meant to be pretty close to coming back from that knee injury. He twisted his knee about three weeks ago, but um, we expected him to be fit, but they've obviously gone with Natawa Akoi mm. instead. You know, he's been very good as well, so I can see why they wouldn't want to make a change this late in the piece as well. Yep, maybe they think Sammy Penny for now is a bit of a line-out jumping option for them and another reason why they kind of gave him, you know, the, that starting jersey to see if they can replicate, you know, an, an extra line-out jumper there. Crazy, but yeah. I'm just I'm just looking at his actual um, lineouts because I know uh, fantasy rugby draft. You can look at those ones pretty yep. easily um, if you give me a moment. That's all right. We can buy some time. Um, so yeah, yeah, that last match up for you. I got it for you. Three, four, seven, ten, twelve lineouts he's taken over his games. Seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, from eleven games. So they do use him kind of once or twice a game. So he is an option there, absolutely. So I think you're right. That that's actually a pretty good argument to keep him in the side to keep that extra jumper. Um, interestingly, the lineouts, the Crusaders haven't been that accurate. And I know that they historically they've scored a hell of a lot of their points off lineout. They're at eighty six percent success rate the Chiefs are at 90 percent and I think you know we saw it last week against the Reds as well with Cody Taylor throwing two of them over the top and that's a pretty established connection between him Scott Barrett and Sam Whitelock but it's still not completely flowing as you'd expect so there's definitely opportunity there yeah last week it was an interesting one with the Crusaders versus the Reds the the set piece was all over the shop the the Reds only won five of their ten um, scrums where the Crusaders only won three of five lineouts. The the Crusaders lost three, the Reds lost four. So they're playing a little bit spoil sport rather than you know really dominating their own set piece. And uh, I suppose the the Chiefs are a relatively solid set piece side. So if if they can get a sniff that they're going to get an advantage there, hopefully it's something that they can you know build on throughout this this match. For sure. And uh, we, we mentioned Cody Taylor. How about the uh, the All Blacks incumbent versus the, I guess, the rising star, Cody Taylor versus Samasani Takiaho? How do you see that one playing out? Who's going to get the chocolates or the, the uh, points on that battle? Look, despite a few mistakes from, from Cody Taylor last week um, and, and maybe not his strongest season to date, he's just got that experience when it comes to these big matches. So I think you'd be crazy not to lean towards him. Samasani Tokiaho obviously has some big plays in him, but if I had to pick one out of these two, I'd be picking Cody Taylor hands down. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the other part of that battle, though, is obviously going to be the scrum battle. And interestingly, you've got the Crusaders on only 93% of their scrums and you've got the Chiefs on 95%. Oh, sorry, 97% for the, the Crusaders, I should say. Sorry. So I think that um, I'm just trying to work out. That's, that must be wrong. Hey? I think it's 93% for the Crusaders. So in actual fact, there's an edge there to the Chiefs in the scrum time as well. I actually think Samasani Takiaho, oh, well, I butchered that, didn't I? Uh, Takiaho is what happens when we record after the origin. Um, <laughs> is a real good chance of showing up Cody Taylor and probably giving himself a little uh, head start in the All Black battle on that front. Look, I mean, he's, he's an exciting young player. And, and I mean, this is going to be the chance for him to really start to assert himself. So it'll be interesting. The other one for me, or the next one for me, is just looking at comparing the sides of tax stats. Yep. They're just incredibly close across the board. Listen to this. So average tries scored per, per match, it's 46 to the Crusaders, 44 to the Chiefs, or 34 points to the Crusaders, 33 to the Chiefs. Average carries per game, 111 to 119. Meters, 799 to 779. Tackle bus, 24 to 22. Passes, 174 to 172. And offloads, 8 first 9. They're almost identical in every single stat. So the way these two teams attack are basically the same. It's just going to be who can be the better defensive side to actually shut the other down. Yeah, no, I mean, these are both two sides that really can attack ball in hand and and love a bit of, you know, space as well. Josh Iwani as well coming into that 15 jersey. Maybe that's something that I think, you know, get them over that line and get them that little bit of an advantage 
um, compared to what they've been playing, you know, throughout the rest of the year with Narawa and Tia Tia and things at the 15 jersey. So, but it's going to be a dynamic game and there's going to be two teams, you know, really having a crack here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think the only other one is the, the rock battle. And we, we mentioned the back row from the Chiefs of Finnau, Jacobson and, and Peter Gus. But the Crusaders have got Matera, who I think is in exceptional form the back end of this season, unless yep. he gets yellow carded. Uh, <laughs> Tom Christie and Cullen Grace as well. And I thought Grace had a really good game last week. So that's going to be huge to desert, to see who can take advantage and actually get the quick ball out to their strike weapons in the back line. And Ruck success, 97 versus 96%. So both sides very accurate in that area as well. So I think it's going to come down to the small margins. I think this one's going to be closer than most people think. It's an interesting one, though. I mean, yes, we're talking about the back row and we, we talked a bit about the forwards. You look at the back end of this match and the Crusaders, when they're bringing on um, Corey Kello and Zach Gallagher, the, the Chiefs are bringing on Sam Kane, Nato Akoi. I think much more of a dynamic, much more of an experienced two players coming in. So it starts to turn the game a little bit, you know, their way throughout the back end of this match as well through, through that forward channel. Yeah, but the sub, I, I, I completely agree. I think it's, it's, it's an excellent point, but then I think that is outweighed a little bit or, or evened up a little bit when you've got Enor and Bridge coming off or Drummond, Enor and Bridge compared to Roe, Poi Hippie and Chase Tia Tia. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of yeah, like the reserve don't... forwards versus the reserve backs, isn't it? You don't bring those three on for the Chiefs. Now, Ch- Chase Tia Tia, he's, he's a really exciting player, um, but he just hasn't you know reached the, the levels we've seen in, in previous years. And what's your tip for this one? What do you? How do you think it's going to play out? Look, it's it's got to go the way of the Crusaders for for mine. Um, I haven't really thought deep and long and hard about how how far it's going to go their way, um, but I think I'm going to go the Crusaders, and I'm probably going to go by ten points. Wow. Okay. I'm. I think it's going to be a lot tighter than that. I I tipped five points, but I was just I was thinking it actually could go closer to be honest. But I've I've got my money on a fiver. I uh. I almost convinced myself to make it really, really tight, but then I also went, hang on, it's the Crusaders playing at home in the finals. So Yeah, yeah fair, fair enough. And you're uh you got you got anyone named for the fantasy man of the week? And I, I want to know this now so I can take him off you tomorrow night and draft. Uh it's it's Sever Reese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, mate, yeah. he uh he has that that look about him at the moment where he just wants to be the bloke scoring all the tries. And when he does that, he's pretty untouchable. So I think it's a pretty good pick. He he went looking for it um last week and and it was his best game I reckon we've seen him in in, in at least 12 months. But um I, I don't like I don't get me wrong, I don't think there's anything wrong with Nana Satoro's defense, but he's also not an outstanding defender. So I, I think Severis, you know, could get a sniff there. I'm going to go a bit left field. I think Josh Shuane, if they can find his way into the game and give him a lot of ball at first receiver, I think he's electric. You know, I, I from a uh, fantasy scoring point of view, I think he rivals Richie Moe when he's at his best. And yes. I think they're going to give him a lot of ball. They're going to give him some in wider channels as well, as well, where he's encouraged to run. And I think he could have a big game for them. He's going to play that DMAC role for them. Yeah. So definitely he's a guy that was notoriously good at fantasy footy and and we could see something similar. Yeah, absolutely. Let's push on to the second game of the semifinals. You've got the Blues versus the Brumbies on Saturday night. I think it's at five o'clock as well, same time as the, the Friday night game. New injuries on this one. Obviously, Dalton Papali'i, everyone's aware he got pulled late. Originally, they said it was illness and they didn't mention what it was, but we now know it's appendicitis. So he, he, I think he's had his appendix out now, so they're saying he'll probably be gone for about six weeks and obviously you won't see him in the finals. Then we also had Bryce Heem get a concussion or pick up a concussion last week. And, of course, the Blues have not named their team lineup because they hate <laughs> rugby fans. So we don't know yet if he's recovered, but uh, we'd like right, to think I, he will. Can I just confirm that they don't just hate rugby fans. They hate media. They hate their opposition. They hate, you know, anyone involved in the game. Hmm. That's pretty much who they hate and they're disrespecting by doing this week in, week out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%, but we'll, we have vented on that many a time, so we'll push on. <laughs> Lenny Katow as well, disappointingly, has been given three weeks, dropped to two uh, for his high tackle as well. He's going to go through that Brumby's frame, the tackling framework, sorry, the safe tackling framework. So that would mean that even if they get knocked out here, he'll miss his second game as a club game, they've already said. So he'll be available to play England, but no 
chance of him playing in the Super Rugby finals again. The uh, the other players coming back, so Brumby's Rob Valentini has been confirmed from Huge. his hamstring injury, which, as you as you say, yeah, I agree, it's a massive in for them. Look, and uh, he's he's potentially been the most influential player in Australian rugby this season. That's a very big call, <laughs> uh, but I I'm dead serious about it. I, I think he has just been so important to how the Brumbies play and get over the game line. I think it's it's a fair call. He has been so good. <laughs> Yeah, no, fair enough. And uh, I mean, the, the we're umming and ahhing. We haven't heard any announcement about Caleb Clark. I reckon he's he's play, paying a lot to play this week. I don't think he's going to be back, but uh, I guess we'll find that out tomorrow. Many people might know that when they're listening to this already. So I guess we'll push from there and we won't dwell on it for too much, but it would be a miraculous recovery, I think, if we do see him. Yep. The last time these two sides um, met, the, the Blues stole it at the death, 21-19, with a, a field goal on, on the buzzer. Um, the penalty count was 16-5 to five with two Brumbies yellow cards, um, which led to a, a blow-up post-match. Yeah, that's right. Obviously, Alan, I like <laughs> trying to be diplomatic, but saying, you know, we're expecting to get an apology post-game, but that's... that doesn't win us the match. That's Which, not diplomatic. <laughs> that's that's as angry as the man comes. Yeah, that's right. That's that's him losing control, but it was still <laughs> yeah. pretty diplomatic, i got to say. That's <laughs> why he's such a big legend. Um, yeah. And look, I, I think the other thing is uh, the Brumbies made a huge amount of tackles in this game. You know, that was the the heart they showed in this game to hold the, the Blues out. I think the Blues only scored two tries when the Brums made 213 tackles to 102. And from memory, I think it was even in just in the first half, they held the Blues over the line three times. So Blues were dominant and getting over the line a lot of the time when they were close to the line, but the Brumbies just scrambled so well. And that that heart, I think, and that belief will go a long way for them this week. And they seem pretty confident out in the media that they have a good game plan to attack this match. Yeah, a lot of the time when Aussie sides act confident, say we're confident we're going to this one with confidence, you get very upset. But I actually believe them. And, and there's a, a real sense that they believe they can do it and that they can really have a crack at this one. So it'll, it'll be good to see them walking into this match, you know, full as a, a good of uh, excitement and, and just being ready to go. But neither team here has won the grand final since the Brumbies did back in 2013. Oh, sorry, been in the grand final since the Brumbies were in 2013. Um, the last time they won was actually back in 2004, but I think the Blues was the, the year before, back in 2003. So there's two fan bases that that are really, really keen to be able to have a shot at glory and, and get the, the win in Super Rugby here. But for the Blues especially, they had, you know, a 10-year period almost of just nothing but, you know, dire results year after year. And they've started to really build back in, you know, in the last year or two. So, they're going to be really, really keen to see the Blues get over in, in this one. Oh, absolutely. And I think the New Zealand rugby-backed Blues um, uh, <laughs> are definitely being given every opportunity to win this competition. But they're an excellent side, 14-game winning streak they're on now. Uh, they're leading the the tries tally for the season with 69 as well. Enough for two. And they are obviously undefeated at Eden Park as well. The only game they lost was technically a home game in round two to the Hurricanes, but that was down in... Queenstown when they were still in their three-week bubble to start the season. So no one has tasted success at Eden Park. And I think it's going to be, you would think, surely sold out and a very hostile crowd. So how much does the 16th man come into play? That's the big question. Yeah, no, look, it is, it's a massive thing for the Blues. Um, Just a really, really hungry fan base for some success. Um, don't get me wrong, they had success last year, but it's, it, it is different to what they're, they're going for in 2022. So they're going to be vocal and, you know, they, they talk about a home field, you know, the advantage you get with ref is, uh, I think it's, is it a penalty every 10,000 people or something along those lines? Yeah, that's exactly what I was just confirming. Yeah, so Ben Darwin had, had has been known to say that they only said they could find about a home advantage is exactly that. The ref will uh, generally give one extra penalty per 10,000 fans. Eden Park holds just under 50,000. So I'm going to call that wow. four extra penalties. So hopefully yep. we're not starting from a benchmark of 16 to 5 or whatever we said from last week because that's a hell of a lot of penalties for the Blues. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. 
Um, look, the Blues, look, obviously you touched on, we don't have a lineup here, but word is that Nepo La Lala will start over Offa to Uma Farsi. Um, that's probably the only change I think we can see up, up front. Um, the, is that you, you agree with that in the, the front row? Obviously, Eklund's been so solid for them. Yeah, hundred percent. And and I think same with Alex Hodgman. I just don't think that they're gonna they're gonna rotate that. Big Carl's come back and is is playing a bit better again. But Hodgman's yep. been rock solid. I think he's clearly first choice, and I don't see why they would change that. And um, in the absence of yep. Papa Lee, we've got probably a, Adrian Choate coming in as their their option for the seven. And look, he's definitely shown some promise and. There's no doubt in, in my mind, it's still a significant loss. Um, Papa Lee, he's just been so solid over the ball. He's been so solid in defense. He, he's another uh, ball runner uh, for them. You know, uh, runs like he's a Satutu or Akira at times, which is pretty impressive. But yeah, he's definitely a huge loss. Yeah, I, I think on a normal round game, I don't think it is that big of a loss, to be honest with you. But in a big match, I think that's where... We're going yeah. to see the difference. And, you know, Papali's best matches, I think his best match of the year was against the Crusaders where I remember yeah. him making that run where he shrugged off three or four tackles and scored in the corner on the left post. Just had an amazing, amazing game. But if you look at the actual stats across the two players for the minutes they're playing, it's actually pretty equal. I think um, Adrian Schultz made 114 of his 117 tackle attempts. That's 97% compared to Dalton Papali'i, who's at 92%. Uh, Papali'i makes a tackle every 5.17 minutes to Choate's 5.5 minutes. So they're actually pretty close in their tackle accuracy. And then they're running sim- similarly as well. Choate makes a run every 16 compared to Papali'i's every 20. So, you know, neither of them are big runners of the ball. Um, but no doubt Choate is nowhere near as effective as a runner when he does run. Papa E has had 17 tackle busts for the season to Choate one. So even if you look at the fact that Papa Lee has had almost double the minutes, that's just chalk and cheese with the damage that he can take make there. The, the thing about it sometimes is, you know, stats are like bikinis, Harry. They're, they're revealing, but what they hide can be more important. And Papa Lee, it's just his work around the paddock, hitting breakdowns, being involved in absolutely everything and and being there when the Blues need someone to be there. That's, you know, if, if someone is making the cover tackle or making a big hit in tide and things when they need it, often it is him as well. So you, you can't really put stats on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, the other thing I think is, with the loss of that running game, I, I think we're going to see more and more of Akira and Hoskins, you know, they yep. had both, you know, I don't think it's a surprise that they both had big games last week because all of a sudden you had two running back rollers instead of three. Yep. In terms of the back line, probably the only change we're going to see here, um, we're going to see probably AJ Lamb being assured that right jer- uh, right wing jersey might be left wing, but more than likely right with the absence, we assume still of Caleb Clark and Bryce Heem with their injuries. Um, yes, he did get called in late, um, but still, it's a change in our eyes from from the lineup that they've named. Well, he, um, yeah, he, he um, Bryce Heem obviously started and was concussed, so yeah. AJ Lamb came in early in the match. But I thought he had an excellent game as well. He scored one off um, that high ball that kind of bounced awkwardly, but he was rock solid under the high ball, made a lot of good runs as well. So I don't think they'll have any hesitation of bringing him in if they're not no. completely convinced about Bryce Heem's progress. Who do you bring on to the bench spot then for, for the Blues? Um, it, it, it depends. I think Talia is now gone for the season, Taniyelu Talia. So I guess that means it's probably going to be Radamadavuki Nedkins. Yeah, you got him or Sullivan, but I mean, you're not going to really want to sh- shift Perifetta with how he's playing. So, well, I think Zahn was already on the bench. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so, so uh, Nipkins is probably the option, unless they bring in an extra center or something like that. Then you've always got Rico that can push out. Uh, yep. Actually, you know, I think we've talked about before their entire back line could probably play wing if they really <laughs> yeah. needed to. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Look, there's there's a few things that could happen there, but AJ Lamb seems like the safe money. Um, look, the, the Blues have a really, really strong forward pack with dynamic runners that we've been just touching on then uh, out wide. I think a real strength for them is using the likes of Akira, Papali'i, Satutu. Um, only going to be two named this week, but 
they've just got the ability to draw a lot of that defense in on them and give those opportunities out wide. If, if we look at the, the Brumbies out wide, they've got the likes of Muirhead, who has made 69% of tackles throughout the, the year of 2022. And then on the other wing, it, they're not doing that much better. They've got Tom Wright, who, you know, he's only got 73% for, for 2022. So it, it is a bit of a weakness defensively for the Brumbies out wide. So if they, you know, end up getting sucked in tight with these bigger bodies, it's going to put a lot of pressure on those wingers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Mark Talay has been on a bit of a tear this season as well. So even without Caleb Clark, I think Bryce Heem, AJ Lamb, Mark Talaya, they're, they're going to really run over those guys. And uh, when you've got the the skill inside them to get the ball to those guys as well, I think it's going to be a pretty worrying area for the Brumbies. And I think the only way they can stop it is if they really get off the line hard and try and cut off any wide ball, which is, which is to be honest, the tactic I assume they'll make. But how yeah. Ollie Sapsford handles that, considering he's played so few minutes ever for the Brumbies, you know, he has been coming off the bench, but very few minutes. I think he's, the most he's played is like 12 or 15 minutes in a game. Um, I that's the big big question mark for me. Yeah, look, it's his it's his first start, and it's going to be really tough with him. You know, in the absence of Vikatao, um, I w- I was keen to see hopefully you know Chris Firewise or Tia being named, but I'm guessing he still must have a, an, an injury back from that hammy tear in, in round five. Have you had any updates on that, Harry? No, there's just absolutely nothing. And it's been like eleven weeks or something. So yeah. he's he's either a pretty bad high hammy tear or he's back and they're just not looking at him in the selection frame. And I think they're pretty settled in their 23. So it wouldn't surprise me if they just don't see it because the same thing is Jesse Mogg was a PCL injury. He was meant to be back about two weeks ago as well. So I just think that they're happy with their 23 and they're not rotating them in anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's fair enough. But it, I think he is just that perfect person to come in in these sorts of moments, even if it is off the bench for them. Um, I, I know that, you know, they don't have many other options to cover that 12, that, that 10 jersey if Boliseo went down. So they've got, you know, they've, they've got to have that sort of stuff covered on the bench. But I would just love to see him. You're saying you know, CFS very little. cover 10, are you? No, I'm saying I know they need to try to have things like that covered. Yes. But uh, I, I think, you know, his ability to cover the wing or cover the centres, that sort of thing is is quite valuable. And he's got a lot of experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if he had an injury-free season, maybe that would be more of a choice, a, a, an option for them. But I reckon they see Sapsford as the bloke that can cover centre and wing as well. So purely based on the fact that he's been there all season, I, I think you and I just love Fao Al Sortia as well. So I think both, both of us are maybe I mean, biased to wanting to get him in there. But then we're talking about Hudson Crichton as the bench option as well, you know. So even if CFS is coming in, he could be that one coming in on that bench spot if he was fit, ready to go. Yeah, but now they've got Andy Muir, head Tom right on the wing. Sapsford can push out to the wing as well if needed. And then Hudson Crichton, I think, can probably play 15 or I think can he play a bit of 12 as well? In, in, I think he's, yes, mainly centres, but could cover 15 as well. Yeah, so so I, I guess it, they've got options anyway. But I know what you're saying, absolutely. Look, on, on that note, obviously pushing over to the Brumbies, um, Tom Hooper, I think this is probably the big point for me, is Rob Bellatini coming back in. They've pushed him to eight. They've pushed Pete Samu to seven. And they've rewarded Tom Hooper for his excellent, excellent form and kept him at six, which means that Reimer goes out of the 23 altogether. Is that right? No, he's onto the bench. No, no, the bench. Jerome Brown. So um, they. to to me, this is not only a, a bit of a pat in the back to Tom Hooper for how good he's been, but also I think it's just a big body to try and actually compete against the likes of the huge, huge forwards in the Blues pack and the game line that they get. Mm. So I think that's a pretty good option for them to have both Hooper and Valentini to try and stop that forward mo- momentum from their big ball carriers. Yeah, look, I think that's definitely fair. And, and Hooper has just been really, really impressive for them. Um, he's a great line-out option as well, um, being you know long-term trained as, as a lock, but gets to a mountain of work. 13 tackles last week. Um, and, and eight runs. So he's he is a, a big member of their side, and, and I do love to see him get rewarded. Rhyme has been very good, I think, when he's had his opportunities. But as you said, if you keep uh, Pete Samu on, then between those back three, you know, you've definitely lost all the size. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I I was looking at the again the forward pack battle on this one. The the contrast in styles here is so much more obvious than the Crusaders versus the Chiefs game. If you have a look just again at how the two teams attack, 
I think the forwards really need to to dominate from the Brumbies if they're going to have any chance in this game. They're going to have to play high percentage rugby and and basically play it like a test match, give the the other team absolutely no opportunity to actually run with the ball and score with the ball. But from how they attack, I think it tells the story. You got twenty nine compared to thirty four points. The Brumbies not scoring quite as many. 4.6 tries to the Blues, 3.9 tries to the Brums on average, but carries 102 to 185. Now, keep in mind, when we looked at the last game, the Crusaders were at a 111 and the Chiefs at 119. So both teams not running the ball nearly as much. The Brumbies are 559 run metres per game to 723 from the Blues. So again, far less metres being run with the ball. 23 to 16 tackle busts, they're down there as well. And passes... 137 versus 111 as well. So they don't throw the ball around nearly as much. They don't run with the ball nearly as much. Remember, we're talking both teams in the 170s for passes in the other game of the semifinals. Yeah. And then offloads eight and five. It just speaks to the fact that the Brumbies are going to have to kick the corners, play their field position, play for contestables, make sure their set piece is really, really solid. Look, I think they showed the blueprint last week, and I don't think that blueprint changes. They had less ball, um, and they you know, really made the, the, any mistake pay in terms of set piece in terms of, you know, not being strong over the ball. So, uh, and I think Rama was a big part of that, but Pete Samu's hard on the ball as well. And, and Valentini really adds some starch to that forward pack. So it really is a, a matter that these Brumbies forwards need to take ownership in this side. And if they can, then it doesn't matter if they have less ball in hand, they, they still know how to find a win. The, uh, uh, we're still on the point of these set pieces. The Blues only have an 84% line-out win compared to the Brums 87. So I think that's an opportunity, absolutely, when you think about the rolling mall that they have as such a weapon. And it probably does encourage them to continue to play that kind of kicking game and pressure game. The scrum, though, the Brums are only at 89%. And I feel yeah. like I thought it was going to be high considering the class of Slipper, Ala Alatoa, uh, Fenger and Nuku, and then their bench of Monaghan, CEO, even Kautai. I think they're all excellent, excellent players. So I I think Offatung Gafasi was shown, he's showing his weakness last week in the scrum. So bring Nepo in again for them, the Man Mountain. That will be a really, really important battle. I just don't think the Brumbies can afford to lose that because if they can get some good attacking platform, the likes of Barrett, uh, two of us are Sheck and Rico. I'm just going to carve up that new centre pairing. Yeah, look, I, I think you're right. Um, but the the Brumby scrum has been up and down at parts of the year. The year at points, it's been you know 100 successful, like last week, and, and at other points, it's it's struggled a little bit more so. And I think that has been when you know maybe we've seen Sio on the paddock. We haven't had Ala Alatoa on the paddock as well. And there's been you know a couple changes throughout the year in in terms of those two filling certain roles. So. Uh, this is the full strength front row and it is a very solid second row in terms of size as well. So I don't think they're going to be too worried in terms of the scrums. I hope you're right. Um, tip for this one. I've got blues by eight points. I think just over a score. Um, look, I actually care about Australian rugby. Uh, I'm going to say the Brumbies are going to sneak a win here and and rain on the parade that the Blues have. 14 wins in a row is very impressive. And I think really the best thing for them could have been to have a loss against the Tars a few weeks ago, bring them back to reality. And uh, instead, they're going to get brought back to reality this week from the Brumbies. Sudden death, I like it. And my tip for player for this week, it's got to be Rico Iwane running against the Oli Sapsford <laughs> combination with the outside backs as well. I just think he's going to have a bit of a field day there. Sap- Sapsford might surprise us, but geez, I wouldn't put my money on it. Rico's a bit of a weapon. Look, Safford uh, hasn't had many tackles, but he's been relatively solid there. One person that hasn't been relatively solid in terms of their defence is Muirhead. So I'm going to go who pretty much whoever's running at him and... Look, more than likely, it's not Mark Talea, but um, he's just the bigger threat than AJ Lamb. So I'm going to say Mark Talea. All right, I like it. That wraps it up for us. So when uh, when I'm right and you're wrong for the tips, we'll uh, <laughs> come back and I'll revel in that next week. We'll also you're gonna, know wait. You're going to revel in the last Aussie team getting kicked out. Is that what you're saying? No, just in me being bang on the money with my information. That's all. <laughs> I might put some money on the Brums just so I don't feel like I'm departing them, you know, because I really well, that's do want them. Silly to... money. Put your heart on it, Harry. Don't put your money. True. Um, look, we uh, we also have our 
part, second half of our semi-final battles in fantasy footy. You're facing an uphill battle against Kagi, and I've got uh, a, a slim lead, I think, against Blake. So Worth. hopefully the two of us are still in the battle next week, and I assume you might just uh, disappear if you're not in the final and Kagi is. Uh, mate, worth noting, you, you've you got a good lead um, and I've got a little bit of work to do, but I'm still doing better than you in terms of my points per week. So you can say play the man, but uh, you, you're just a lucky man, that's for sure. You're right. Play the man. That's what happens when you come first. You get those, uh, those benefits. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for listening to our short pod this week. We'll be back next week to wrap up the semis and to preview the grand final. Hooroo.